For you guys that are visiting with us this morning, we are, we are journeying through 1 John, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, looking at this short letter. Today we'll be starting in 1 John 3, verse 4. First John chapter 3, starting in verse 4. John tells us here, he says, Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. Whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. He who sins is of the devil... For the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifest that we, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever has been born of God does not sin, nor his, or, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. And then verse 10 is, In this the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Um, whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love uh, his brother. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, it speaks truth to us. Lord, it, uh, it, sometimes it says some hard things. It challenges us, Lord, as, as we're going to look at today. And, and Lord, we pray that you would just, uh, just give us that uh, the outpouring of your grace to receive and to, to understand what you're saying here, Lord, and, and that, Lord, that your words would change our life. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Like I said, for you guys who are visiting us, we're, we're going through 1 John verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and we're looking at a bunch of things in here. And um, if you guys that are visiting uh, know anything about uh, this short letter, these five chapters, um, and we've talked about it a good bit for, uh, for all of us that have been here uh, through this study, uh, you know, John's addressing a lot of things in this letter uh, that, uh, that he was coming up against um, there at the end of the first century, and, and uh, specifically it was false teachers that were creeping into the church and, and uh, bringing in false teachings about who Christ was, and that's why he starts there in 1 John chapter 1, uh, kind of identifying who Jesus is, that, you know, that he walked with Christ and he... He spoke with them, and he saw the miracles and, and all that. And, and so as he's writing to the church and he's, as he's writing to us today, you know, he said many times uh, through this up until this point, and he's going to say a couple more times after uh, what we're going to look at today, you know, kind of be on guard against those that have crept into the church and bringing in false teachings. Um, and, and one of the things that uh, we're going to look at specifically this morning uh, is that one teaching that we addressed uh, several months ago when we started this uh, letter was the teaching of these false teachers that were becoming known as Gnostics, um, is Gnosticism, which simply means to know or to have knowledge. Um, and so these guys would come in and they would, they would claim to have like a deeper understanding or a deeper knowledge of God, um, even above the apostles and John specifically, and even above God's word. And, and John says, you know, be on guard against them because what they were doing was, and there's different camps of them, I'm not going to get into that this morning, but uh, there was different teachings and camps of the Gnostics of these false teachers. And one of them, and we're going to look at this this morning, uh, would say that you could be a spiritual person, you could be a godly person, you can trust in Christ and belong to a church and all that, um, and still be en route to heaven. But because you still live in the flesh and you still have these temptations and the different types of things that go on with you know, the world, the lust of the flesh, he talks about there in 1 John 2, uh, the lust of the, uh, you know, the pride of life and the lust of the eyes and all that, you can indulge your flesh. And so these Gnostics, these false teachers were teaching, you know, you can be spiritual on one side, you can go to church, you can do your church thing, you can uh, you know, uh, believe in Christ and, and claim all this, uh, but then you know, kind of Monday through Saturday you can live kind of a loose life and do whatever you want uh, to do. And John has addressed that several times um, through this. I'm just going to briefly go over because we're kind of half, getting, getting to the point of being halfway through this letter. Um, when I uh, started this study, um, I, like I told you guys, I went down through these five chapters and I kind of narrowed them down to ten different things uh, that John is going to give as an evidence if you're truly born again, if you truly know Christ, if you're truly in a relationship uh, with Jesus. And I'm just going to read the uh, first couple that we've addressed so far, just kind of catch folks up that's kind of coming in this morning um, with us. Uh, and so John has given specific things through this letter to kind of check yourself. Because he made several statements there in chapter 1 and chapter 2 about, you know, what people that claim or say certain things, you know, I'm a Christian, I do this, but their life doesn't really back it up. He says, you might want to check that because, and he uses pretty forceful words, you know, he says you're a liar if, if that's how you're living your life, that you're not abiding in the truth is, and also you're not abiding in the light. But uh, the first thing that we noted was in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9, uh, there it talks about 
Um, and, you know, admitting that we're sin, we're sinful. There's some folks out there that will claim not to be <laughs> sinful. And I was listening to a story Jan was talking about last Sunday about some of the kids that she teaches. Um, and, you know, they, uh, she'll ask them a question, you know, are they sinful? Are they sinners? And, you know, little kids are like, no. Like, and Jan was telling the story about, well, she's like, well, I'm a sinner. I've sinned. And uh, I guess the little kids were blown away. You're a sinner. Oh, my goodness. If you're a sinner, well, I guess I am a sinner. You know, and, and that's the one thing John addresses here. You know, that we, we have to confess that we're sinners, we, and if we don't, it, the, the Scriptures tell us that we, that we lie. 1 John 2, chapter 2, verses 3 and 5, uh, talks about guarding uh, the commandments, guarding, you know, God's Word in our lives, that we're obedient to the things that we hear um, as we go through the Scriptures and we apply them to our lives. And that's the second evidence, you know, if, you're true, if you truly know God. The third thing that I addressed, we talked about, was found in 1 John chapter 2 and 20, um, and then also it kind of echoes it in chapter 5, verse 18, and chapter 5 and verse 20. Um, but he says, you know, if you're truly born of God, he says you have this anointing, he says, that you might know all things. Um, and so if you're truly uh, born again, you know, as you begin to, uh, you know, if you're being influenced by these false teachers, and they're, they're still out there today, there's false ta- uh, teachings about the scripture, false teachings about who Jesus is, there's all kinds of Jesuses out there. If you're truly born again, what John is telling us is we have an anointing that when those things come to us, we kind of get that check in the spirit, so to speak. And we're like, well, you know, that doesn't really line up. And so what that is, that's actually a good thing. It's kind of a, something in our lives, which is the Holy Spirit uh, that's checking us. And then uh, what we're going to look at this morning um, is, uh, and it's really talked about in 1 John 2, 29, but we're going to um, look at um, it um, here uh, in chapter 3, the beginning of chapter 3. It's the idea of practicing or pursuing righteousness. And if we're truly born again, if we truly know the Lord, um, we're going to have a lifestyle that pursues after and practices right living is the idea behind that righteous, being righteous, uh, right living. So he starts out here in verse 4 of chapter 3. He says, whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. What a, you know awesome place to start a Sunday morning study with those words. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And so John kind of gives us a little bit of a definition of what sin is. You know, most of you probably heard that uh, the definition of sin is missing the mark. So God has certain standards that he expects and he really commands us to, to obey being the commandments and the things that God places in, the, in his word. That if you're going to go to heaven, if you're going to be in heaven one day, you've got to kind of be perfect and, and uh, meet all those. And so then he defines sin as missing that mark, not holding up to the standard that God uh, would want us to hold up to. Now John tells us here that sin, that sin is actually lawlessness. And what that simply means is that when we commit sin, we're breaking laws. And, but, and I'm going to quote a guy here named John Stucks. I think he lays it out pretty well, kind of gives us that definition. But when we commit sin, what we're actually doing, even though we're committing lawlessness, we have to look at the deeper part of that. And behind the scenes is that we're actually being disobedient, disobedient against the, the lawgiver. God, who is the lawgiver, the lawmaker, that's what sin is. We're being disobedient uh, against God. And so then what John calls it here. Um, is lawlessness. And then verse 5 is the good news, because we just ended it right there at the end of, of verse 4. And if we agree with First John chapter 1 and verse 9, where we all have sinned, you know, Romans tells us that we all fall short of the glory of God, um, and then there's no good news, um, we're not going to fare very well one day when we stand before a holy God and have to give an account for our lives, knowing uh, that we have committed lawlessness. But the good news here John brings in here in verse 5 is simply this. And it says, and you know uh, that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him, you know, he's referring to Jesus, and in him there is no sin. Whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. And so the first thing that John gives us here is the first reason. We're going to look at the two reasons here in this section of the text this morning uh, that John gives for Jesus coming. So when we came off two Sundays ago, we took kind of a break last Sunday, um, but a couple, couple Sundays ago, we came off of the end of chapter 2 and the beginning of, of chapter 3, looked at those first three verses. Um, John's talking specifically about Christ's second coming for his church, you know, us having assurance before him at that coming. We can have a level of boldness, and, and the reason why is because it talks about there in uh, verse 3 of chapter 3 that we purify ourselves just as he is pure. The end of chapter 2 talks about us practicing righteousness just as he is righteous, and when we live that kind of a lifestyle, when we live that way before the Lord, what John is telling us, then we can have this confidence or this assurance before him at his second coming. And now John now is jumping back here in verse 5 and referring back to Jesus' first coming, not his second coming, 
that he was referring to just a couple of verses prior. So now he's talking about the first time that Christ came. It says, and, and you know that he was manifest. That idea is openly be, be made known. He was revealed to us in the coming of Christ to take away our sins. And so that's the first reason uh, that Jesus came was to take away this lawlessness that we commit, the sin that we commit. You know, and if you're in Christ, you know, you have this forgiveness of sin and this great assurance uh, that whenever he comes back for us, you can have that level of, uh, of uh, confidence and boldness that he was talking about there at the end of chapter uh, 2. Uh, Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, the, uh, Gabriel, the angel, came to Joseph and was, uh, told him about uh, what was about ready to happen um, with, the, with the birth of, of Christ. And he says, and, you, and she shall bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. See, that's the purpose of Christ's coming, to save his people, to save people uh, from their sins, to have the, that ability then to have that forgiveness of sin is the very thing that John is talking about here in 1 John 3 um, and 5. And here's this quote that I, I, I like. It's, I don't know if you guys are familiar with John Stott. He was a, a guy that wrote all kinds of commentaries, a pastor, really a great man of God. He talks about what sin looks like and what sin is in, the li- in, in people's lives, and he says this. He says, we often fail in the battle against sin uh, because we won't call it for what it is lawlessness, just like John is telling us here in 1 John. It's an offense against the great lawmaker, God. Instead, we say things like, well, if I've done anything wrong or mistakes were made and so forth, John tells us here, call it for what it is, for what it is, sin and lawlessness. The first steps towards holy living is to recognize the true nature and wickedness of sin. You see, and so that's a problem, I think, a lot of times, even within the church, with me, with I'm sure you guys too sometimes, you know, is getting caught up in those things, thinking, you know, because, you know, I've been a Christian now for so many years or whatever, that you, don't, you can't get caught up in sin. You can't get, uh, you know, well, I'm a Christian now. I, I don't really, you know, sin. I'm forgiven. Um, but we still have to deal with it because when John writes this letter here, he's writing to Christians. Um, and there at the end of chapter one, he says, you know, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and the truth and the word, his word is not in us. He's writing to us. You know, we still sin, but as we grow in our faith in Christ, as we look more like Jesus day by day, you know, the level of sin that's in our lives, the things that we practice, the things that we go after should decrease really day by day. But he doesn't simply leave us there, you know, as people that commit lawlessness and sin against God, because there in 1 John 1, 9, he says that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us um, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so that's that idea that he's been talking about as we've been looking at, that idea of abiding with Christ in that relationship. When you have that relationship with the Lord um, and you understand kind of what John Stott is saying here, that, that you, when you commit sin, you're committing lawlessness against the great law uh, uh, giver, which is God, and you're calling it for what it is. You know, you're just not giving it some cute little name or whatever. And, you know, and you have a kind of a brokenness about you towards it. Um, and then you apply 1 John 1, 9 to it. When you confess those sins to him, you know, it says he's faithful and just, just then to forgive you of sin. But the sad thing about it is many people in the church still toy with sin, still toy with the things that the Lord says that shouldn't be in the life um, of someone that is making a claim or profession of faith in him. And that's what John is talking about uh, this morning there in verse 6 when he talks about whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever has this relationship is the idea with Christ he says, does not sin. Now, if I just look at that and I don't think of anything else, I, don't, I, I just I hold that verse right there. I don't think of anything else that he's saying, you know, th- uh, what, what the Bible says uh, throughout the scriptures, I would have a, really a, a feeling of condemnation on me. He who abides in him, if I'm claiming to have a relationship with Christ, I, it, it says I, I can't sin. But whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. But, uh, you know, that's a kind of in-your-face in type of a statement. You know, because... I sin every day, really. You know, I don't do everything perfect. I don't do, you know, I don't measure up to what God's standard is that's given to us in the Word. But what that means is, whoever abides in Him does not sin. Uh, the Greek word behind that simply means, it's, it means a practice or a lifestyle of sin. So what it would mean, and I kind of included, I think I included the, uh, another version up there that kind of lays it out. It says, no one who lives in Him keeps on sinning. So the idea behind what John is saying here is that if you're a true child of God, you know, there should be a mark in your life when you can separate from the time of your old days when, before Christ and the time that you came to Christ, you're born again, and your life begins is changed and it's renewed, and, and, uh, and then the sin is differently. I can remember when I was in the military, I wasn't saved then, um, you, know, I would, you know, I was engaged in all kinds of things. I've been very upfront with you guys uh, about my past, especially in my 20s. You know, I used to have issues with alcohol and everything else. Uh, you know, the things that kind of go on with uh, people in, in the military, but I can remember, you know, I was a church kid. I grew up in church, but I never knew Christ. 
and you know, I would, you know, you'd get sick from drinking too much alcohol or whatever, and I'd find myself there, you know, praying. You know, that one time I pray, you know, Lord, you know, if I, you may, if you let me get better, if you make me feel better, you know, I'll never drink again. I mean, who's ever said that? If you're on, who's ever, you don't have to raise your hands, but I'll, I'll raise my hand for some folks. But when I came to faith in Christ, I, mean, I had no, I had no guilt about it. I had no like, con, there's no contrition, no brokenness, when, you know, during during that time period because I didn't know the Lord. But um, now, when I do things, I also was all problem because I had an issue with profanity too in the military, you know, and I haven't used it since I came to know Christ 17 years ago. You know, now if I slip up and say something like "dang," you know, oh, you know, I just, well, what have I done? You know, I was like, well, then I don't even remember how I used to talk it was crazy. But now, as I, if I say that, you know, in a way, I, I hurt myself, or I do something, or I slip up, and I say something as silly as that word, um, there's, there's, kind of, there's, there's something that comes over me. And what it is, it's God's Spirit now living in me. And, because, and so that's what John is saying here. You know, whoever sinned has never seen him nor know, known him. If I truly know Christ, if I've truly seen Christ and the work of Christ in my life, I'm going, I'm going to be uh, purposing in my life, and, and kind of the title of what this message is, is pursuing righteousness or practicing righteousness. My heart's desire now is to be pleasing to the one who has been manifested, like John is saying here, to take away my sins. So that I can live with power, I can live in his grace, I can you know, begin to know who he is, and know that the reason that Jesus came here was to take away our sins, you see. Well, if that's the reason that he went to the cross and died a brutal death, why would I want to engage in the things that he died for, for me. So if you're truly born again and you have that relationship with him, we no longer abide in a committing lawlessness or committing sin, uh, and we do know him. And so what John is he's John has some hard things to say through this letter if you read uh, the five chapters of this letter, because he doesn't, he really doesn't mince words. You know, and we're going to look at it here in a little bit. You're either a child of God or you're a child of the devil. You're either abiding in light or you're abiding in darkness. You're either believing the truth or you're believing a lie. With John, there's no gray area. You're either on one side or on, or on the other. Um, and what he's sa saying here is there's this great life. There's this, there's this ability to, now to live a, to this awesome life when you come to faith in Christ, knowing that he's forgiven you of your sins, giving you then great liberty then to live out your life um, for him. Now, I want to go down through and look at a section of Romans because I think Paul addresses it well as he goes down through here. And a lot of times what he's going to do through here, he's going to ask questions where there's no answer, but you can hear the answer within the question about what it looks like, and what John is telling us here, what it looks like um, to, as a Christian if you're purposely now engaging in sin. You know, Paul says to examine yourself actually to see if you're in the faith, that we can't be living a life like that. And John challenges us here in the same way that Paul's going to challenge us um, here in Romans chapter 6. Now, I don't have the entire a section, the whole chapter, so I've kind of just went down through it, just to look at some of the things that John or that Paul has to say when it comes to sin in the life of, of a believer. Romans chapter 6, starting in verse 1, it says this, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin? The idea is, should we continue to practice sin? Should we continue to abide in it, continue to do the things that, 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 are, that, are, that are lawless towards God? Shall we continue to sin in sin that grace or that God's grace may abound? Verse 2 says, certainly not. No, 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 he says. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? And you can hear the answer there is we can't. That's the answer to that question is we can't live no longer in sin. Verse 12 says, therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body uh, that um, you should obey it in its lusts and do not present your members of inst of inst as instruments of right unrighteousness to sin but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. See, when we come to faith in Christ, I believe that we have a part in how we live. Yes, we have the power that we've talked about here in, in 1 John. We have this anointing to know all things, that we have a, the, uh, the Holy Spirit living within us to guide us and to instruct us and to teach us. But if you look at some of the words that Paul has to say here in Romans chapter 6, there's certain things that he says, I believe, uh, that, that tells me that I have a some kind of a part in living out my life and living out my life in such a way that I'm not sinning against God or I'm not practicing sin, kind of the things that John is telling us here in 1 John 3. Back there where it says, therefore do not let sin reign. How, how do we, it says do not, we're, we have that responsibility. Don't let it reign in your body. You know, if you have, like for me, like, like I said, I've been up front with you guys. I've had issues a long time ago with alcohol. I don't hang out in bars. That's me. 
Why don't I, I mean, I don't go to there to think I'm going to have some kind of like a bar ministry because I know me and I know the struggles that I've had with alcohol in my past. And so I don't go to bars. I don't go to the new, what is it, uh, the one here on 11? Yeah, they, they always make great food, don't they? Bars always make the, the, the best tasting food, but I don't go there for the, I don't even go there because I know if I get into that environment, 20 years ago is going to start creeping into my mind. 20 years ago, the things that I struggle with, you know, could my flesh, even as a person that's been born again, that loves the Lord, could I say, well, you know, I'll have one beer. What could one beer do? Well, we all know that one beer turns into two beers and two, you know. And then somebody at church sees me or somebody that I've been talking to about Christ sees me, and then my witness is soiled. Real, I mean, it really. So I think that for me, I have a part in it. Therefore, do not let sin. Don't go to the bar. Don't let it rain in your body. Don't give it an opportunity to flare back up is the idea. Verse 13 says, do not present your members. So we have that ability to either present or not present our members, it says, as instruments of righteousness, that's right, or unrighteousness, that's not living before the Lord the right way, to sin. So here's what uh, Paul tells us that we should do, but present yourselves. So we have a, this ability to do something. Present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members, you know, the things that we do, how we conduct our lives, the way we think, there's all kinds of things behind that, and your members as instruments, you know, as tools that God can use and for righteous living and doing the things, you know, that God would have us to do. Verse 15, Paul continues, what then shall we sin? So he's kind of repeating himself. What's, shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? And he repeats himself, certainly not. No, you can't. You can't do it. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to, you are that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to unrighteousness. You see, if we're honest with ourselves, if you take yourselves back to that place in your life uh, when you didn't know Christ and you were engaged in the things of the world, you're doing the things that Paul or John told us here in 1 John 2, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. He says, are not of the Father, but of the world. You're engaging in those things that the world says you can engage in. They're drawing you. If you're honest with yourselves and think back on that time, were you not a slave to it? I mean, what, what does it mean to be? It means that you're obeying your master. You're being obedient to something, and that's what Paul is telling us here. And what John is telling us here in 1 John chapter 3 and verses 4 down through 6 is that if you're abiding in that kind of a lifestyle, that you're enslaved to that kind of thing, that you're obeying the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, that you're a slave to it instead of being a slave to God. Because if you're, he says if you're being a slave to God, if you're being obedient to God and he truly is your master, he says then you're being obedient. And what he says there at the end of verse um, 16 is that, that that is then leading to righteousness. You're pursuing righteousness. You're, you're living right before the Lord. Paul continues in verse 22 and he says, but now having been set free from sin. You see, when we come to faith in Christ, the, the, the sin, the lawlessness, that the way that we used to live no longer has a, a kind of a, a foothold, it no longer has like uh, anything over us in the same way, you know, when I was freed from it, now I never felt like I was enslaved to go back into the problems and the sin and all the things that I was engaged in before I came to know Christ. I've been set free from it. And by the power of God and his, the Holy Spirit, I have now the ability to live right, to present myself to God as an instrument of righteousness, doing the things that he'd have me to do. And Paul continues and says, and having become slaves of God, you have your fruits to holiness, and the end is everlasting life. And so as we live out our lives, as we've placed our faith in Christ for the forgiveness of our sins, we've been freed from that master. What he's telling us is the end result is everlasting life. And that's what John's told us here in 1 John 2. You know, uh, as we looked at, like I said a couple weeks ago, uh, verses 28 down through 29, the first three verses of chapter 3, we can then have that level of confidence or that level of boldness when Christ returns. And the only way that you can have that level of confidence or that level of boldness in front of Christ <laughs> is that we're abiding in him. We're practicing righteousness just as he is righteous. We're purifying ourselves, he says, just as he is pure. And then this last verse here in verse 23 in Romans, we all know it, it's a famous verse. He says, for the wages of sin, the idea is the payment of sin is death. That's separation from God, that's hell is what he's talking about because we're all going to die physically. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus um, our Lord. And so what uh, Paul was telling us here is, is the very thing I believe that John is telling us here in this study as we're going through First John because he talks about it a good bit uh, through this letter 
that, you know, don't let these guys influence you. Don't let these Gnostics, these false teachers, influence you with false teachings about how you could uh, know Christ, you could be born again, you go to church, you do your thing, but Monday through Saturday you can live however you want to live, you can engage in whatever you want to engage in. John says, you're a liar and you're not practicing the truth. John has hard words to say, but I like hard words because the hard words, you know, will penetrate our hearts. It, it, makes us, it makes us check what we're believing. It makes us check whom we've believed in. You know, am I believing in the one that John's telling me here that was manifested to take away my sins? Am I abiding in him? Am I living righteously? Am I pursuing righteousness? Am I practicing the things that God wants me to practice? You know, or am I the kind of person that Paul talked about there in Romans 6? You know, what shall we say? Shall we sin or continue to sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. You know, am I the kind of person that, you know, I'm saved and God's gracious, he's merciful, and, you know, he's going to forgive me, and he does do those things, and he is merciful, and he is gracious. But we can't use God's grace and his mercy for, you know, uh, just hey, I'm, I'm for a season of whatever I want to do. Because what it does is it begins to expose your heart um, for who you really serve. And, then, and so we're going to look down now and continue here in 1 John chapter 3 and look at, and like I said, John doesn't like separate, he's no gray area for John. It's either one way or the other. You're either you're abiding with Christ or you're not. You're either walking in the light or you're walking in darkness. And he continues there in verse 7, and he says, little children, let no one deceive you. And I'm sure when he wrote those words, he had these Gnostics, these false teachers in mind. Don't let anyone deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. So John's heart here is that, we don't be, that we're not going to be deceived by people that are coming in. And, and, you know, back then, because of the nature of just what it was in the first century, uh, they would have people moving about the churches. They would have, you know, they call them itinerant ministers. They would move around, and some were good ones, and, we'll, and you'll see in uh, in uh, actually 2 John and 3 John as well, but you see people moving around and John would give instruction to accept these brothers and they were good people, but in the same way, false teachers, these Gnostics would get on the trail and do the same thing because for them it was making money. Jude talks about them in the book of Jude a little bit. They're all about, it says, you know, filling their bellies full, it says in there, uh, you know, uh, taking advantage of, uh, of what was good and they would sneak along the trail and they would bring in these false teachings about who God is and he says, be careful, but you know, today in 2015, what are, the, what are the paths, what are the avenues that people can get into our lives in the technology, you know, time that we live in, in, in you know, TV, Internet, books. I mean, there's all, there's all sorts of ways that, you know, we can watch things on TV, we can watch, we can stream something on the Internet or whatever, and there are a lot of false people out there. They're saying all kinds of things, uh, but it doesn't line up with, you know, we got God's Word now settled. That we don't, you know, if you don't know this and you begin to look at these things and don't check it against God's Word, you could be found believing the things that John is coming against right here, against these ones that are deceiving them. Um, and that's one of the things that he's addressing right here is don't believe these folks that are saying that you can have faith in Christ and all that, but live however you want. He says, he says that doesn't go hand in hand. Because he says he who practices righteousness is righteous. And he just doesn't leave it there because it says just as he is righteous. See, that's the standard. It's not my standard. It's not, I don't follow Jim, even though, you know, we're, we're to... We're to, we're to have fellowship one, with one another. But if I model myself after Jim, or if I model myself after Rick, I model myself after the wrong person. If you model yourself after me, you're modeling yourself after the wrong person. You see, it's about Christ. You know, it's about learning more about tr Christ. It's about abiding in Jesus. And that's what this letter really is talking about, abiding in the one that was manifested to take away our sins, you see. But it's just as he. And he's made that a statement a couple times. Back in chapter 2, um, and in verse 6, it says, He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. Chapter 3 and verse 3, we looked at a couple weeks ago, it says, And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. You see, that's the standard that we have to live towards. That's the standard that we have to model our lives after is Christ. You know, I, I need to look like Christ more and more. And now John's going to address here in verse 8, like I said, that, that idea of, of, of people that are either children of God or children of the devil. If you're practicing sin, if you're, you're, you're going after lawlessness, you know, that you have no conscience about it. Oh, yeah, I'm a Christian, but I can go ahead and do the things that, you know, please me. John is pretty forceful here in verse 8, and he calls it out. He says, he who sins is of the devil. The idea of sinning, though, because I sin, that's not what he's talking about. He, what he's talking about, that those words mean he who practices it. Like there's nothing, like you, you could easily go into it without even thinking about it. You can easily go into practicing sin and doing something that's against God and there's no, you know, there's no check in your spirit. 
That's what he's meaning by this. He who can continue that life, he who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned uh, from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. So John now gives us the second reason. We looked at the first reason back there in verse 4. says that he was manifested to take away our sins. So, and like I talked about there in Matthew 1, 21, when the angel Gabriel came to, to Joseph and said, you know what, You're gonna, his name is going to be Jesus. He will save his people from his sins. That was the first, time, first uh, reason that John gives us. The second reason now is that for the, this purpose, the Son of God, that Christ was manifested, was, was given to us, openly re revealed is the idea behind that word, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Second reason. Who here knows that the devil is still alive and doing well? Everybody should raise your hand because I'm sure you're, being, you're harassed by him, you're whatever. What John says there that he might destroy the works of the devil, that word actually in the Greek doesn't mean complete destruction. Uh, the, word actually means to rob, the word actually means to rob of power. That's exactly what that word means in the Greek. So what, it, what he's saying here is that he might rob of power the works of the devil. Because if you study, uh, you know, the whole outcome of Satan and look in Revelation chapter 20, I believe it's like verse 10 or 11, but... Um, You'll see at the end of the story, the end of the book, Satan is finally cast into the lake of fire to basically to attempt to bother no more. But for this time being, um, he still harasses us. He still bothers us. You know, Peter tells us that he roams about like a lion, seeking whom he may devour. That he's still here and he's active. You know, he's active in all kinds of areas. He's active specifically, I think, in the churches, especially churches that are, that are preaching the word of God, that are desiring to live for Christ, or desiring to abide in the Lord, you know, to be engaged in the things that the Scripture teaches us to be engaged in, I believe that the work of the devil then is there. But the good news is that he was manifested to destroy the ideas to rob of power. We now have power over the devil. You know, if you study Ephesians chapter 6, we give him that armament. You know, the Word of God is, you know, our weapon. That we're, we're actually to engage in warfare, but it's in the power of the Lord, you see. But the devil is still around. His demonic forces are still around. You can see him in the world today, working and doing things. But we still have that power now as we have this, this relationship with Christ and what John is telling us here, that he was manifested to uh, rob him of his power. And then he continues in verse 9, whoever has been born of God, and so he's kind of repeating himself, does not sin for his seed. That is the word of God. And I don't think I have it up there. If you just want to, if you're note takers, jot down Luke chapter 8, uh, verses 11 through 15. In 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 23, I think that explains who the seed is. It's the word of God. Whoever has been, who's been born of God does not sin. The idea is does not practice a lifestyle of sin, for his seed remains in him. The word of God remains in us. We're born again, and he cannot sin because he has been born of God, you see. See, if you've been truly born of God, the Word of God has a place in your life. You're obedient to the things, you know, that as we study here on Sunday mornings and, and, and in your own devotions and quiet time study of God's Word, and you allow God's Word to have a place in your life. You know, you allow that anointing that we've talked about, the Holy Spirit, to engage you, to challenge you, to instruct you, to teach you. That work of the devil become, should become less and less in your life. And if the work of the devil becomes less and less in your life, the temptations that he brings, the harassment that he brings then the practicing of sin should become less and less in your life, that you no longer are influenced by it. And we studied in 1 John 2, 12 through 14, um, talking about that spiritual growth, going from babes to young men and women in the faith, then to um, fathers and mothers in the faith, where the enemy no longer really has a foothold in our lives, because as we grow uh, in our faith with Christ, you see, that sin in our lives should be less and less, that we no longer make excuses for it, how Paul was addressing it there in Romans chapter 6, you know, that, that, that God's grace should just abound because I can live in it. We don't even want to sin against the one who saved us anymore because we know what he's done for us. And so God's desire is to make us look more like Christ. The devil's desire is to make us look more like himself, you see. And how, how that plays out in your life depends on what you're giving yourself over to, what you're engaging in. You know, are you spending time in God's word? Or are you spending time in fellowship with like-minded believers that can encourage you? you know, I was talking to a guy this morning, you know, being together is like, you know, the scripture says, iron sharpens iron. So does one man's countenance sharpen that of his brother. Those are things that should be in your life if you want to, you know, uh, look more and more like Christ and, and allow then uh, the spirit to work in your life in such a way uh, that you can be in, you could be in that verse there in verse 9. I no longer sin because I can't sin 
because I'm abiding with the one who was manifested to take away my sins. You know, I'm abiding with the one who has destroyed the work of the devil in my life uh, that I might be well-pleasing um, to him. With that being said, let's cut off there at verse 9. Um, get, you know, if the present worship band wants to come up, uh, we'll do one last song. Uh, for you guys who are visiting with us, we have, um, afterwards we have a Sunday school hour, discipleship hour. Um, we have adults upstairs that are, we're actually going through the Bible right now, uh, doing a six-week study on if this book is reliable, how true is this book, looking at manuscript, looking at all kinds of good stuff. Um, I would encourage you, if you, if you, um, if you can stay, stay for that. Um, we got other uh, Sunday school things going on downstairs as well. But um, So next Sunday we will pick up in verse 10 of 1 John 3.